Matthew 5, verse 8, this is God's word to us. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed, makarios is the Greek word. It means happy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I love that terminology, pure in heart. I immediately know when I hear pure in heart, I want that. You guys know what I'm talking about? Man, I want to be pure in heart. What's interesting to me is I suspect that if you were to poll a large number of people and you were to ask them the question, do you think that you're pure in heart? I think that most people would answer something like this. I mean, I'm not perfect, but yes, I think I have a good heart. I'm essentially a good person is what they're saying. Is that what Jesus is talking about here in that passage? To be pure in heart means to be a good person. Well, that's an interesting thought because in our world, we have so much conflict. Israel and Hamas, Ukraine and Russia, there's civil war in the Sudan and in the Congo. And on both sides of this battle, if you ask both people, I think both would say, no, I'm pure in heart. They're evil. We're the ones who are good. They're the ones who are evil. In our politics, every moral question that we ask, it seems like that people can come to vastly different conclusions and yet claim the moral high ground. We are the pure ones. They're the evil ones. Is that what Jesus means by pure in heart? That it's just subjective based on what I think or what I feel or what I believe to be pure. Can I claim, yes, Jesus, I'm pure in heart. Why? Because I feel like I'm pure in heart. Is that enough? Biblically, that is an anti-biblical worldview. Just so you know and realize, God is the creator of all morality. There is such a thing as objective truth. Not only is there such a thing as objective truth, there is an objective standard. There is a moral law. There are moral absolutes. Not only is there a moral law, but there's a moral law giver. All morality is based on God himself. That's a biblical worldview. And not only is there a moral law and a moral law giver and absolute truth, but we will be held accountable to those standards as his creation. And so when we break those moral laws, we are by definition, biblically, we are no longer pure in heart. And it doesn't matter what I think or what I say. It doesn't matter what culture says about this truth. It doesn't matter what someone else says about morality. At any place in time in which my morality contradicts what God's absolute truth says, at that moment, I have chosen to set myself up as God and say, I am the one who decides. So being pure in heart can't just be subjective. That can't be what Jesus is talking about. What does it mean to be pure in heart? This is the challenge for us. Every time we go to scripture, this is the challenge. To not go to scripture hoping to validate my prior opinions about a topic, but instead to discover what God's word has to say to me about the topic. You understand that, right? So often we open up this Bible hoping that it will validate my prior opinion, but this is God's word to us. It teaches us about him, about us, about the world. And so we have a choice in that moment of whether we will set ourselves up as the gods of our own life or whether we will allow God to be God and take his word at its truth. And so God's word says that that word pure has a definition. It has a meaning. Let's look at that word pure. The Greek word is katharos. And I know I'm not pronouncing that right, but it was a kind of a hard one to pronounce. So katharos is what we're going with. There's multiple definitions that you'll see for katharos. It's used in different ways throughout scripture. The first one that you'll see is in the Levitical sense. Pure in a Levitical sense. Um, 
just a, some quick background. When God gave the people of Israel the Mosaic law, he said that these are the laws that you have to follow in order to remain pure. In order to be in the presence, to live in the presence, these are the people of God, that's Israel. In order to live in his presence, they had to follow a specific set of laws. And some of those laws were about things that you could touch and couldn't touch, things that you could eat and you couldn't eat, uh, things you could do and you couldn't do. And if you broke that law, you were impure. And then you had to sacrifice something. Blood sacrifice had to cover over that purity. Now, there's a lot of reasons for the Mosaic law. We don't have time to get into that. It's supposed to awaken in Israel a conscience, help them to understand the righteousness of God, help them to understand the seriousness of sin, all of these things. But there was purity and impurity. Now, the very best in Israel at following these Levitical laws were the Pharisees. Now, I don't think that Jesus is talking about purity in a Levitical sense because Jesus is never very pleased with the Pharisees' approach to the law. Just take Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 and 26, for example. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, your hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and plate, that the outside may also be clean. What Jesus is saying here is that the scribes and Pharisees were really good at obeying the Levitical purity laws. And yet inside, inside they were filthy. Their hearts were not pure. Outside, their hands were clean. Inside, their hearts weren't pure. Does this make sense, church? And so Jesus can't be talking about blessed. He says, blessed are people like that? No, this is not about the Levitical law. Katharos, pure, can also just have to do with something that's dirty becoming clean, like physically. That doesn't really make sense because Jesus says, blessed are the pure in what? Heart, heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, which means, you know, you can't take soap and water and scrub your heart off. You're not getting dirt off of that. So what Jesus is talking about here, it's not Levitical. It's not purity in a literal sense. What he's talking about is purity in an ethical or a moral sense. So we've got those three different senses of pure. We've got Levitical, we've got literal, and now we've got this ethical and moral sense. This is what Jesus is talking about here. Now, there's really a couple different components of what it meant to be morally pure. But ultimately, what he's talking about is sin. Sin is anything that goes against God. Any rebellion against God is sin. And all of us, there is none of us who are without sin. Scripture says there is none who are righteous. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of our hearts are impure is what that means. And yet Jesus gives us this standard that not only do we need to be pure in heart, so we need to get rid of that sin. Elsewhere, we know that not only can we not do bad stuff, so it's not like don't just sin. It's also we need to do the good stuff we're meant to do. But then not only are we meant to do the good stuff, we're supposed to do it from the, the right motives. These are some high standards and high bars, aren't they? It's hard to understand how any human could ever, first of all, not sin, second of all, do the right thing every time, and third of all, do the right thing for the right reasons every time. And yet, that's what it means to have a pure heart. How could we do that? Well, the answer, of course, is we can't. We can't do that. We talked last week about how we have officially turned the corner when it comes to these beatitudes, the first four beatitudes in Matthew 1 or Matthew 5, 1 through 6 have to do with the inner attitudes of the heart. He says that you're blessed when you're poor in spirit, when you mourn over your sin, when you're meek and you humble yourself before God and you turn to God and say, God, help me. When you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, it says in these scriptures that God will He'll create in us a clean heart. 
God will take our heart of stone. He will replace it with something new. But it cannot be our own efforts that accomplish this. Too often, we are like the Pharisees. We, we worry about the outside and not the inside. Man, we do. And so it is 100% possible, and I would say it's almost a certainty that there are those of us here on a Sunday morning and across the world, we dressed up in our Sunday best. Man, we smiled we shook hands, we opened up our Bibles, we look great on the outside, but we're dead on the inside because we've never allowed God to deal with our heart. Jarrah and I, we, we have two little kids and we drive a minivan. And I'm not ashamed of that, by the way. Minivans are awesome. But I'm telling you, every once in a while, it looks like a bomb went off in my minivan. Can I get an amen from any parents in here, all right? But that bomb is somehow made of Legos and candy wrappers and kids' water bottles, but that's, it's awful. I would be embarrassed sometimes to invite people into my crazy kid minivan. Now, I can deal with that problem. I can clean it up or, and this is what we often do as people, we could take that minivan to the car wash and we can get that outside looking real clean and shiny. And we can make sure that whenever we pass somebody that we know, we're driving just fast enough that they can't see the mess inside. We can smile. We can look out the window, but we're not stopping to show you what's going on. This is the same thing that we do spiritually. We settle for looking good on the outside, getting all cleaned up, doing the right things, but we're not letting anybody get in to see the mess that's really in here. We don't have to live that way. Jesus wants to give you a pure heart. He wants to give you a new heart to replace the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, one that beats in rhythm with his will, one that loves people the way that he loves people. Jesus can do that, but only Jesus can do that. And the only way that we can receive that heart is we start by being poor in spirit. We have to admit our own need. We have to mourn and repent of our sin, turn to God. We have to humble ourselves and be meek and say, God, I need you to do what I cannot do and save me. And if we're hungry and we're thirsty for that type of right relationship with God, he will save us. Now let's talk about a pure heart. A pure heart is a couple of things. We're going to talk about three of them today. The first thing that I see when I see a pure heart in scripture is that it's truthful. If you want to write that down, a pure heart is truthful. A pure heart is one, like we just talked about, that is honest about its true condition. In Psalm chapter 24, verses 3, 4, and 5, we read King David writing this. He says, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? So this is essentially, who can stand before a just, holy, and perfect God? Who is it that will get to be in God's presence? He who has clean hands and a what, church? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false. If we want to stand before God, the first thing that we have to have as a, 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 a pure heart is a truthful heart. We have to be honest about our own condition. Now, the joy in that is that when we're honest about our own condition, God will save us, right? And so it's not just that we turn to God in this one moment of repentance, a pure heart isn't just truthful, it also begins to pursue after God. And that's the second thing. A pure heart is, first of all, truthful, honest about its condition, turns to God, he cleans us up, and then we pursue after him. So often people think that our salvation is the beginning and the end to our walk with Christ. Just pray a prayer, just raise your hand, just walk forward, and yet that's just the beginning. When the Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, here's what he tells him. Here's his advice. 
He says, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So we are to flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. What this means is that those who are those who have a pure heart, this is what they do. They pursue those things. They pursue after God. Salvation is not this one moment in time and then you're done. What we see is that a true pure heart is one that will pursue after all of these things. We're pursuing after God, which means in the morning when you wake up, you need to put your blinders on and you need to pursue after God. You need to open up God's word where you're trying to learn who he is, what his laws say, what his desires are for your life, who you are, and you're pursuing after God. During the day and during work, as you spend time in prayer, you're supposed to be thinking about and pursuing after God. In your relationships, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your friendships, in the purpose of your life, you pursue after Jesus daily. When I think of, when I think of myself as a younger Christian, I was so focused on the sins that I struggled with. I would think about those sins and I would try hard not to do those sins and I would focus and obsess and, and struggle over those sins. And yet in those moments, where do you think my eyes were? It was on my sin. What's incredible to me is that when we will actually pursue these things, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, if we will actually just walk towards God, we leave those sins behind. Incredible change takes place in your heart and in your life. Almost always when I sit down and have conversations with people who are struggling with these things, my advice will be pursue Jesus. Well, I want to change. I want my marriage to be better. Pursue Jesus. It's incredible what happens when you just forget all the other stuff. You put your blinders on for a period of time and you walk after Jesus. That's all you're worried about. I just want to do what pleases God. And you do that for a time and you will stop someday and you'll look back a week or a month later and you'll say, oh my goodness, I am not where I used to be. And one of my favorite parts is that what, what Paul says is that when we do this, if we're doing it correctly, it says that we are going to be pursuing this relationship with God along with others who are calling on the Lord from a pure heart. This is not a journey that you're meant to walk alone. One of the great joys of my Christian life are you guys my brothers and sisters in Christ that I get to pursue Jesus with. You encourage me. You challenge me. I have people that admonish me. I have people that, that lift me up, and I have people that sometimes give me some constructive criticism about my life. The Christian faith is not something you're meant to walk alone. As you pursue Christ, you're going to leave those youthful passions and lusts behind. But as you're walking with other people, they will help you along that journey. So if you're not in a small group, that's what our small groups are for, to build relationships, to build friendships, to grow in your discipleship, to have spiritual leadership in your life. You need to be in a small group. So a truthful heart we see is the first step. So a pure heart is, first of all, it's truthful, right? Right? A pure heart is one that is going to pursue after God. And then over and over, you see that a pure heart is a heart that loves others. I could have picked dozens of verses that talked about this one topic, that a pure heart loves other people. Sometimes we want to know, how am I doing in my walk with Jesus? How's it going? One simple test is, how well are you loving other people? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 
22 and 23. And I, I just picked these verses because I felt like they were helpful. But man, there are so many verses that show that this is how this works. Here's what Peter says. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for in sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. A pure heart loves one another earnestly with conviction, with effort, with action. It says, since you have been born again, since you have been born again, this is the starting point, our new life in Christ. When we're honest and truthful, we turn to him, he gives us a new heart. And when we turn to him and we pursue him daily, daily pursuit, you put on those blinders and you run together. There's this African proverb, you've probably heard it, that if you want to run fast, you run alone. But if you want to run far, you run together. And that's just biblical truth. When you pursue Christ with others, you're in it for the long haul. And then your life will demonstrate a love for other people. A pure heart loves others. And what scripture says, what Jesus says is you will be blessed because you will see God. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. They will see God. Now, there's two different ways that you can understand that. And I think that for us, there's two different sources of hope and joy. Number one, if we do those things, if we're pursuing God from a pure heart, we will see him move. We'll see him move here on this earth. We'll see him do incredible things in our hearts and in our lives. I am not the same man that I used to be. God has changed me. He has done an incredible thing. I've seen it. I've seen God change marriages and families. I've seen people that I would have said would never follow Jesus, raising their hands and lifting them in worship. I've seen God change the hardest of hearts. I've seen him answer prayers in miraculous ways, heal people. I've seen God do incredible things. And if you pursue God from a pure heart, You'll see it too. But that's not only what Jesus is talking about. This also is the promise that someday we will see God in his fullness, face to face. For all of time, man has longed to see God. He'll create idols and statues and draw pictures and whatever it takes to try to just catch a glimpse of what God might look like. And there have been times in this world where God has revealed himself to us. I think in the Old Testament, there's times where God revealed himself to men, specific men in the Old Testament. God, they caught a glimpse of God. Jacob at Peniel, he wrestled with God. Moses with the burning bush and uh, in the tent of meeting. Isaiah had visions and all of these men, when they caught whatever glimpse of God that they caught, they were changed forever and instantly. Jacob got a new name. He was called Israel. Moses has said his face would shine. Isaiah just fell on his face and said, woe is me. I'm unclean. He, he got a picture of himself. But no man has ever seen God face to face. In the Old Testament, God would reveal himself to Israel, to whole groups of people, to this whole nation in some ways. When Israel wandered in the desert, God revealed himself as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. When God met with the people of Israel on Sinai to make his covenant with them, there was fire and there was smoke and there were earthquakes and people were terrified for their lives, fell on their faces just because God's presence was there. Solomon, when he dedicated the temple, it said that a cloud came down and it filled that whole temple with God's presence. And yet, although Israel experienced these miraculous things, they never saw God face to face. The closest we've seen, of course, is in the person of Jesus. God was revealed in Jesus. In Colossians 3, we read that he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. In John 1, 1, we see that he is the word made flesh who came and dwelt among us. 
Jesus is the clearest picture that we have of who God is and what he looks like. But God is not flesh like we are flesh. Church, someday we will see God face to face. He will be revealed to us who call on his name, who have been saved, fully revealed in heaven. Man, I long for that day. I sometimes find myself wishing that I was born a long time ago, that I could have been and walked with Jesus, right? I don't know if you've ever thought this way. Because I read the scriptures and I can see Jesus in the scriptures and I have the Holy Spirit in my heart and, and I, I, I can see Jesus in there, but I want to see him face to face. I want to walk with him and talk with him. But because we live in a sinful world and because I'm clothed in sinful flesh and because God dwells, as, as we read in uh, 1 Timothy, as God dwells in unapproachable light, I can't see him face to face. He is perfect and holy and pure, and I'm impure. But someday we will. John, his apostle, caught a glimpse of God. He gives us this. He gives us this picture in the book of Revelation in chapter 22, verses 1 through 4. It's, this is at the end of the whole Revelation. And he's talking about heaven. And this is a promise to you and to me. And here's what he says. This is what we read in 22.1. The angel showed me the river of the water of life. It was bright as crystal. It was flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. And also on either side of the river was the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And no longer will there be anything accursed. There's no longer any sin or curse of sin. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Verse 4 says, and they will see his face. Blessed are the pure in heart, those who have been truthful and honest, who pursue God who demonstrate that pursuit in a love of others. Blessed, happy, joyful are we, not only because we get to see God move here, but someday we'll see him face to face. Would you pray with me, Lord? I long to see you face to face. God, when this world wearies me, when I'm, tired, when I'm worn out and I'm frustrated, I long for more of your presence. I long for a day when my sinful flesh will be no more, where I won't have these wrong desires, where there won't be this war within me. But God, I thank you for this new heart that you've put to beat in my chest. I thank you that I am no longer who I once was, that you have changed me from the inside out. And I pray for our church, God, that we would not be concerned with external evidences or that other people think that we look this way or that way. I pray, God, that we would be a truthful people, that we would take an honest look at our heart. And God, in that moment that we would sense for those that are far away from God in that moment, that they would sense that you are calling them home, that you want to offer them forgiveness of sins, if they would just call on your name and ask for it. And God, I pray that for those of us who are yours, that we would hear your voice and that we would fix our eyes upon you and that we would keep our eyes upon you and put our blinders on and pursue you daily. God, help us with our distractions. Help us with our fears. Help us with the things that hold us back and slow us down. And God, may we pursue this life, this relationship with you along with others. God, help us to be open with others about our struggles and our fears and our failures so that we might receive help along this journey. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live in us. 
that you offer us your help and your hope, that you give us conviction. And we thank you for the promise that someday we will see you face to face. We worship you and love you, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen.